Stay here with me. Don't think about this woman at home like there's crazy motherfuckers eat their own sh**. Liz Nickerson, thanks so much for coming on to Talk Beliefs from your home in Portland, Oregon. You are the founder of the support site Enthusiastic Sobriety Abuse, a resource for those who have experienced abuse in the Enthusiastic Sobriety programs. In 2004, as a 16-year-old, you were sent to one of these facilities. Today, you campaign and speak out against these programs, programs that you now consider dangerous and cult-like. So how are you doing, Liz? I suppose like so many of us in the past year, you've been having a lot of time at home. Um, have you been adding anything new to the ESA uh, resource site? Hi, yes. Thank you so much for having me. I don't actually run the, the website. I've got a, a great team of people right. working with me too. And so some really talented individuals are doing a lot of updates. Um, but I do know what's coming down the line is getting a little bit more of our archival history of the enthusiastic sobriety programs and kind of how they were started um, and just giving a good uh, archives on um, the beginnings and the ends of this program. Well, before we talk about your own time within the enthusiastic sobriety program, let's just get an overview of the program, how it began, what its aims are, and its main figures. There is a lot to, you know, for these enthusiastic sobriety programs, they began in the early 1970s. Um, Bob Behan is the founder of these programs, and uh, he's quite a character. He is a recovering drug addict. He was in Texas working as a janitor or a ditch digger or something and was attending um, recovery meetings in the basement of a church, um, but really had a knack for talking to teenagers, just being highly influential and helping some of those kids kind of like in the midst of that war on drugs era, really kind of uh, encouraging them to like quit dope, quit, you know, marijuana, yeah. essentially. Father Charlie, I believe, who was uh, running the church, um, found that he was very influential and uh, was successfully sobering these teenagers up and kind of allotted him some more time and space to use his facility. And eventually, um, they founded the PDAP, or the Palmer Drug um, Drug Abuse Program. And, uh, and that was the first treatment f facility that Bob began. And from there, he was able to kind of expand. He got a little bit of notoriety. Um, Carol Burnett's daughter actually mm. attended PADAP. And um, I think that's really where his like funding took off as well, because um, because of that uh, endorsement from Carol Burnett. And he actually went on several interviews, you know, on national TV just endorsing this new program and approach to sobriety. Dan Rather with 60 Minutes did a pretty damning interview of him. And it was kind of showing the light that uh, as this program may be successful um, in sobering teenagers up, it's shifting the dependence from drugs and alcohol onto Bob himself and Bob and his program himself. Um, it becomes very insulated. Um, you're discouraged from outsiders, even old friends, even certain family members. And even in that interview, you had ex-staff members mentioning of like, there would be children admitted to these programs who didn't have drug problems in the first place which then definitely uh, helps your case to say that you have a high success rate when people entering the program don't even have an affliction with drugs in the beginning. So it was easy for them to sober up. Um, but after that interview um, and a lot of like conflict of interest and Bob getting paid by certain referral programs with hospitals, 
um, he was removed from PADAP and started branching out and starting new facilities. He started some in California that got shut down, uh, same in uh, Vancouver, BC. He moved kind of all over the place and kind of got chased away. And now he's been able to successfully start and maintain several programs that are throughout the United States. Um, there's the Insight program in North Carolina and Georgia and starting in Florida. Um, there's Cornerstone in Colorado, Crossroads in Missouri, and Pathway in Arizona and California. And there's a new branch uh, called Full Circle in some of those states that are now endorsed and um, funded through the Catholic Church. So Bob is actively expanding. He has formally retired, but uh, his son-in-law is now the director and president of these programs, um, Clint Stonebreaker. Uh, he was, Clint Stonebreaker was also a patient of his and went through the program, I think at 16 or 17, and um, has been there ever since and has never left and uh, married into Bob's family. Yeah, it's really kind of the structure of how this works is in Bob's ideology. Uh, he really touts himself as he has no degree, no professional training. He's got, a, I'm misquoting him, but he said it all the time of like, he got his degree from the streets or something. And so he knows drug addicts and he knows how to like work the system. And so he brings this bravado and this edginess to this recovery approach and really honing in on kids and it seems really harmless and it seems really encouraging but it's all but his whole take is this peer pressure sobriety and that if you could have more fun being sober um then like getting high and using substances you know becomes obsolete and so he encourages this enthusiastic sobriety uh -huh. and and it's very it works so well especially in the way that you wouldn't really want to speak out or it's hard to navigate the abuses that happen within these programs because as i'm sure we're going to get into it um <laughs> with, with all the emotional and psychological abuses that are happening um, through your treatment, you're then inundated with staying up all night. Your parents are told to completely back off, like no rules, no curfews. You don't even have to stay at home anymore. Um, your parents are suddenly buying you cigarettes. You don't have to go to school anymore. They even encourage in Bob's literature, um, beyond the yellow brick road, uh, fun felonies where like hmm. minor arson and minor vandalism <laughs> <laughs> is completely acceptable and encouraged. Um, and it's this, you know, ideology of like, as long as you're sober, nothing can touch you. It is to be of note that uh, mostly all of the participants or group members are upper middle class white uh, children. And so um, there's a lot of privilege to be able to run around and burn down abandoned buildings and not get arrested because uh, you can just call a counselor and say, well, like, we're all sober. We're not doing drugs. And that's happened many a times. So it's kind of crazy that when you think back or when you're in the midst of it, you're having so much fun, you know, kind of like living in this fantasy land where just rules don't apply to you, um, it's hard to then turn around and say, like, also, like, not only was I learning some very wrong and bad social skills there, almost in your mind, especially as a teenager, cancels out the abuse of, like, well, I can't complain because I was also having, like, the time of my life mm -hmm. playing kickball at 3 a.m. with slip and slides or something, you know? <laughs> uh, so it's very distracting in that way to keep you sleep deprived, excited all the time, 
and you're just surrounded by 60 different teenagers who are all really cool and really energetic and there's absolutely no rules. Probably the best way to describe what it is like to be sent to one of these programs is to hear your own story. Liz, you were sent to the Atlanta program in 2004 when you were just 16. So why did your parents send you there? And what were those first few days and weeks like for you? So my parents brought me to Insight with good reason, because I was definitely struggling. Um, I was struggling with substance abuse. Uh, I was struggling with depression and anxiety. I had reoccurring thoughts of taking my own life. When I was 12, I was sexually assaulted and I started drinking shortly after that, though nobody in my family knew that had happened to me. Out of nowhere, I just suddenly started really acting out. My grades, you know, I struggled with uh, learning disabilities, and so my grades were always kind of not great, but then they got really, really bad. I was able to switch schools, and I got introduced to not only just alcohol, which I had been drinking, but other substances. And so very quickly, I started using every day. It no longer became a weekend thing. It was you know, quickly it turned into during school, after school, skipping school, using a loan in my bedroom, <laughs> you know, not the typical 15 year old going out to parties, but just a lot of um, isolation and intoxication. And it was very concerning for my parents, especially because uh, coming from like a nice upper middle, uh, middle class household, very preppy. And then suddenly I was this weird goth kid. Um, I think my clothing probably upset my parents more than anything, but I wasn't doing major, major drugs, but I was consistently using every day. I was pulled out of school and put into therapy, I saw a psychiatrist, saw so many, you know, um, different specialists. Um, I uh, switch back and forth between living with my mother or living with my father um, because tensions would rise between me and either parents and they were just kind of struggling. I'm also the oldest child so I was their first teenager as well. <laughs> and, no experience in, in having teenagers. Yes and I think that's something about um, most of the parents here is that like life's hard and then it gets harder with a teenager. Um, there's no doubt about that. Finally, uh, after a series of just, you know, bumbles and headaches and fights, my parents kind of uh, had enough and got real scared and decided that I needed some serious help. They've been trying for a while to get me some help and nothing was quite sticking. And so they called around and I think my therapist at the time recommended this treatment facility because uh, North Carolina, we actually have some great uh, treatment facilities, but it's all for people mm -hmm. over, you know, adults. You had to be yeah. over 18. And so there's really not a lot of options um, for minors. And I think the first one that came up was this Insight program down in Atlanta, Georgia. Somebody in my school, just the grade above me, uh, was already down there. And so we kind of got referred through this therapist and then again through uh, another parent. And I was told it was going to be an eight week program. And my dad just drove me down to Georgia. I'm from North Carolina originally. So we mm. had a nice little road trip to rehab. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> We, uh, I got dropped off in Atlanta, Georgia. The head counselor met with my father first, mm -hmm. uh, separate from me. And then I went in and met with him uh, afterwards. And it was very strange. And it was yet like this guy was only like 25-ish. And he was just chatting with me. And he was really nice. He was uh, very charming. And also very cool, you know, just kind of giving me a little bit more of a um, 
not shaming, not like, oh, you're just some drug addict and all messed up. He was kind of like, like almost like praising it, like, oh man, you know, you must be really bad and cool or something. And, um, this sounds like love bombing starting. (laughs) Yeah. It was just kind of like really encouraging and disarming and, um, effective. Uh, what was the most effective and surprising is when I got out of that, uh, first little meeting, um, my dad was there ready with a carton of cigarettes and that kind of floored me because my father was the most avid anti-smoker. Um, my grandfather was a smoker all his life and had cancer. And so my dad was, uh, vehemently against cigarettes and here he is with the carton of cigarettes for me <laughs> and uh and that was something that the program really encourages and it's kind of like this odd little like look kind of look what power we can wield over your parents and also mm-hmm. here's a fresh new nicotine addiction so i went in and my dad left and all of a sudden um i'm surrounded by like five or six teenage girls who were really cool. They had just stayed up all night the night before and they still hadn't gone to sleep. Um, But they were so excited to meet me. They were um, telling me they love me uh, instantly and giving me hugs and like was so excited I was going to be there. They were trying to offer me food or buy me food. They would even light my cigarette for me. Um, like it was an overwhelming sense of like attention and excitement and um, then they they were told to do that yes yeah you're encouraged that's part of their program is an indoctrination too is um, once you get well enough once you get good enough um, then you get to be the person to help and uh, reach out to the newcomer it's also very intentional that like that's part of the real recruiting process is to keep like 60 extra kids around um, for years so they can help indoctrinate and bring in and keep um, because I'm sure I wouldn't have been as attracted to sticking around if there was only like the 10 of us in the outpatient program you know, so I was told that it would be there an outpatient for eight weeks that ended up being 16 weeks. And then that 16 weeks didn't quite, uh, I was officially out of their treatment, but, um, I was, I stayed for another two years. Um, <laughs> and, uh, there were other kids there who, uh, were there for five years or six years that I met just hanging out, um, mostly not in school, maybe some low wage job uh, just to afford your cigarette and gas money. And the Uh, parents continually paying the monthly exorbitant fee. Well, actually the, the, how they set it up. And I think it's what keeps the parents not as investigative is it's just a one-time fee of $10,000 to send your kid. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's, uh, you know, so it's not this like monthly thing so much, um, but just initially upfront, they typically don't take insurance. Um, so it's uh, very much for the people who can afford it to pay out of pocket. They have a residential program for kids who need it or also for when their attendance is low and they're not getting new recruits. Mm-hmm. Um, and that residential program is 45 days. You usually get shipped to Atlanta or Arizona. Um, and I believe that's an extra uh, $25,000 hmm. um, to go there. I have heard of many other people who, even after being in the program for a year or two years with no relapses, suddenly the counselors are telling them that they're doing really poorly and they need to go back into outpatient. And so they need to go back and have another 10 grand session, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's usually done by having them call up your parents and tell you like, Hey, your kid's on the verge of relapse. And if they relapse, they'll die. You know, Um, we need to do something quick. 
I've heard of families taking out, you know, uh, second loans on their, you know, loans from family members or uh, a second mortgage on their home to be able to afford a second round of treatment for their kid that's apparently about to just die. A lot of financial investment does come into play, um, but it's not regular enough. I think if there was this monthly fee, they would probably uh, have a few more questioning parents of like, so what's actually happening? <laughs> so in getting these kids, what's also really interesting about this these particular treatment facilities too, is that there's absolutely no drug testing. Um, I think they do it once as a technicality in the state of Georgia, but most of them don't. And so when you get accused for relapsing or that you need to go back into outpatient, they operate off of a program of honesty. And I think even on one of the web pages for maybe it's Crossroads or Cornerstone, uh, they encourage parents not to drug test their children. Um, saying that if you suspect your child is a drug addict, you're just probably right. Um, and it, even in Bob's literature, he says that, you know, everybody experiments with drugs. You know, you have, I have, but doing it once is experimentation. Doing it twice is substance abuse. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit over the top in their evaluation, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And so, um, so you have just kids either with real substance abuse problems um, that I identify with myself um, and others who have maybe just held a joint in their hand twice <laughs> and got caught. And some uh, overprotective and worried parents mm. are sending them to these facilities and everybody's just getting labeled in this blanket diagnosis of you're a severe drug addict. Well, after that initial welcoming and settling in with new friends, things started to change. Liz, what were your experiences within the facility as the weeks rolled on? As it went on, what was really kind of the shift was when I began their actual outpatient program. And that was Monday through Friday. Um, I believe it was from noon to 4.30 every day. I was not in school. I was pulled out of school. So that was my schedule. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, there were meetings in the evening for the entire group. Um, and then Fridays and Saturdays, uh, there were functions and activities where all that fun and excitement, you know, of like glow in the dark four square or something, you know. But then you're also encouraged to spend all of your time um, with other group members. Uh, there was absolutely no room or were you allowed to have any alone time or private time. What was also really strange is, and I think what kind of um, prevented or worked against me in thinking of like how problematic um, these places were, was that I was never locked in a facility. I wasn't in these like, you know, uh, troubled teen. Well, it was a troubled teen <laughs> industry branch, but it was this strange element of being in outpatient uh, that there were no locked doors and I wasn't ever trapped. Um, so in my own mind, too, I was like, well, I could have left any time. Um, but through this outpatient program, I you get the grooming really starts and the indoctrination really starts. And so while I'm in outpatient, you are really at that time, the star child, like all the attention is focused on you. You know, that's the fresh new group of kids who need the most help, who need the most love. So a lot from the group members, the love bombing mm. really comes into play. And so you're um, always kind of like, asked to sleep over at someone's house or asked to like ride in the car and you get the front seat and your all your things are paid for but during the actual outpatient counseling sessions you know when we're in this group therapy essentially you get broken down you get broken down um very much in the in the light of like synanon in this attack therapy kind of method 
where like, yeah, there's jokes and fun and silliness that kind of happens, but then it's aggressive questioning on like uh, your sexual trauma you may have experienced, you know, and talking about that in a group setting um, with uh, boys and girls in there and having to express not only that it happened, but really explicit details. And then you're allowed to get cross-examined by your other group members. And the whole point is one of the major ideologies coming out of this program too, is they tell there's no victims, only volunteers, you know, and to like a degree, uh, like all these little ideologies, like have some truth to them of like, I can understand why, uh, you know, you need to take responsibility for your life. That's a nice lesson to learn. But to the extreme that gets preached in these programs, um, for example, is I had to, it was the first time I ever talked about my sexual abuse that I experienced when I was 12. I had never told anybody, but it got dragged out of me there. And after sharing the explicit details and recounting what had happened, um, which was really traumatic, and especially to do that in a group of other teenagers, boys and girls, I then had to have the group help me understand uh, what was my part, you know, and how I put myself in that situation and how if I had self-respect, um, that wouldn't have happened to me because if I respected myself, other people would have respected me, you know? And so it's a really like dehumanizing experience and a lot of like getting broken down. Um, but that same no victims, only volunteers didn't just apply to sexual abuse. Um, a friend of mine was born with uh, congenital heart defects and she was told that she must have done something wrong in the womb to deserve it, you know? That like disabilities and sicknesses and ailments, you volunteered for it, you know? They really kind of, and this is where this magical thinking kind of comes in, is they were told, or you're told that uh, you chose your life before you were born. And so if you were born into an abusive household with abusive parents, you chose your parents and you chose to like live this life and to have those lessons. And it's just the most uh, <laughs> damaging thing. And yet um, as you're getting beaten down in this treatment facility and in these, you know, outpatient sessions, you're then bolstered up with a lot of love of like, but finally you made it here and we love you and you're the scum of the earth, the drug addict, but don't worry. We are too. We understand you're safe here and your parents don't understand you. You know, the school system, your friend, your old friends don't get it. And so it's kind of like you finally arrived here, like you've gotten the message. It's a lot. It's a lot to kind of balance. And then you're being, you know, you have these rough, rough therapy lessons and you get applauded for how vulnerable or how, you know, the more vulnerable and open and honest you are as in completely exposed, um, get celebrated and uh, you're really stripped down to nothing to be like rebuilt with this ideology that you're a drug addict and you'll be nothing more than that, you know? But it really does remind me of like when somebody's drawn into a church, a cultic church, and they're told, mm -hmm. you know, you're a sinner and your life is going nowhere, but uh, you're here with us now and you have to stay with us and, you know, avoid other people on the outside. Yes, yeah, it it's, uh, sounds very familiar. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it's, you know, another point of like my outpatient too is my counselor was 20 years old. He was a 20 year old um, man, boy. <laughs> he had four years sober and he was just a, a former client himself. You know, he had probably only been a, a counselor for about a year with no actual training. He was, again, he was just some 20 year old kid and he's 
dragging out details of sexual trauma and dragging out and uh, sharing these ideologies of disabilities or karma from a past life. And I mean, all of this is coming from the top down, you know, from Clint Stonebreaker and Bob Meehan. Like, I really don't remember a lot of talking about how to stay sober and not do drugs and how to, you know, go into society and not be afflicted with substance abuse. It just seems like they wanted to press everyone into a certain mold that, that, that they were comfortable with. Exactly. Because instead, in, instead of learning life skills on how to re-enter into society as a sober individual or just someone who doesn't abuse alcohol and drugs uh, to the point where it's unmanageable or a problem, there was more of like, well, uh, this type of sexual position is spiritually fit and this other one is not, you know. Um, they are even getting down to how you can groom your body hair, um, which is strange to tell a bunch of minors um, how, to, how to groom their pubic region, you know. And that was just a discussion that was um, often had, you know, just these strange ideologies and opinions. And so on top of the dragging out sexual abuse trauma and telling victims there that they volunteered for it or that you um, just no belief in the medical community. Um, when you are first arrived, you're actually taken off of any and all medications, you know, um, antidepressants, uh, anti-anxieties, uh, even like basic medication. I've, I was discouraged from my inhaler because I have asthma. And uh, which was a nice combo, too, with my brand new two pack a day cigarette addiction. I know another kid who had diabetes and he was discouraged from taking his insulin because it was just deemed sketchy. He went into shock a couple of times. Like uh, they really believe that doctors and medicine, you know, are all quack um, and just discourage any outside help like that. Birth control was not considered sober. My counselor found out that I had gotten onto birth control and actually told me to get off of it because it was uh, mood or mind altering. You know? I'm, beginning, I'm beginning to think when they say sober, they mean conforming to our own political leanings. <laughs> yeah, there was definitely political leanings in here. Um, also, uh, it's uh, uh, somebody uh, joked that they went into this program, you know, pretty liberal and came out alt right. I was told that um, liberals uh, can't get sober because they have too much victim mentality, um, but that also uh, included um, BIPOC, uh, people of color um, cannot get sober because they also have too much victim mentality. Feminists can't get sober either. A lot of other extra strange, rigid, like they really tout they only have three rules of that. No fighting, no fixing, and no, um, I'm trying not to swear, but the F word. And yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of vulgarity in this program that makes it really cool and edgy to teenagers just, you know, um, having a sailor's mouth. So, but, uh, but yeah, and it was really um, some strange and rigid rules left and right, you know, coming out here of like, you weren't allowed to exercise, you weren't allowed to go on a run because that was an isolating activity, you know, or it was being too vain and um, girls needed to be pretty, but not too pretty and, you know, um, if girls tried too hard and put on makeup, they were told to get off of it to, or to stop wearing makeup. And if girls were too masculine, um, they had to be put on dress commitments to look more girly, you know, um, like small little things like that. But also, you know, preaching that um, I saw the training manual for the counselors and one of the books they read is men are from Mars and women are from Venus oh, yes. and, and they 
they teach that kind of in how they they don't address sexual abuse or assault that even happens within the group, which is rampant among group members, that women don't ever want sex. You know, that old trope of like women are uninterested in sex. They don't have sexual desire. And so therefore they never want it. And it really heavily implies that they don't, they can't ever consent to it, you know, and that's when they kind of go into this whole like, well, every woman will claim rape because no women, no woman wants to have sex. And it's just this disempowering and wrong stuff that they push that, uh, you know, then if any woman does or girl does express any kind of sexuality or sexual desire, she is deemed bad or un spiritually unfit. There's a a lot of swearing. So any derogatory names are just told to her face. You know, I was called that by um, my counselors, both male and female counselors of just every sexual derogatory name out of the book, even mm -hmm. making up some new ones to tease me about um, my sexual past. Um, I was called a prostitute for uh, being a minor um, who was uh, sexually promiscuous and it was like my parents paid 10 grand for me to just get slut shamed um, at a treatment center. Well, those two years within the program are long behind you now, but you work hard to bring awareness to the harm of these facilities through enthusiastic sobriety abuse and expository counsel of survivors of enthusiastic sobriety programs. So first of all, can you tell us how you exited the group? and then what people can expect to find when they explore the ESA website. So after I was there for uh, two years in the program, I was taken off of birth control uh, because it was not considered sober. Um, and I had actually gotten pregnant with a number, another member in the group. Um, dating was allowed. Uh, it was a little bit suggested of who you can and cannot date and um, obviously very controlled much like everything else um, but I had gotten pregnant and uh, and I kept it secret um, and my boyfriend and I then uh, we had decided to um, terminate the pregnancy and uh, afterwards I ended up confessing to my counselors um, just in this, I need some help. And it was a very like rough and tough time to do this as a, uh, I had just turned 18. And so I was pretty lost and I was really looking for a lot of help and support. And my two male counselors um, accused me of getting pregnant on purpose and trying to trap my boyfriend and told me to leave. And I was terrified of leaving because usually um, what happens is when you get kicked out of the program, uh, counselors encourage your parents to kick you out of the house. Um, a lot of group kids experience homelessness if they ever decide they want to leave or get kicked out. It's probably their biggest tool of obedience is you always know there's a looming threat that um, you might lose your house. So I was pretty terrified of that. but. Oddly or not oddly, um, counselors didn't call my parents to tell me why I was getting kicked, to tell them why I was getting kicked out um, because I had gotten pregnant in their facility <laughs> with nobody knowing. And uh, I know that's pretty self revealing there, but I really wanted to share it because um, before that happened to me, I know of one other girl that that happened to within the group and she was uh, also kicked out. Um, and then since I've been out, I personally know of three other instances of that happening within the North Carolina programs of other young teenage girls getting taken off of their birth control and then getting pregnant and asked to leave, which just sucks for the most vulnerable part of your life. Uh, it's a big thing that can happen, especially to a teenage girl. And, um, their one and only support structure rejects them. And uh, I just really want to illustrate how callous that is and how if anything that threatens the integrity of their programs um, 
you know, or make somebody look a little bit harder of what's actually happening, you know, within these facilities um, gets quickly expelled and with no care and no support. Uh, but yeah, I was, I was, I was kicked out. Um, and I had a pretty hard time after that too, because again, my emotional dependence was all in this place. Um, about six months after leaving, I made a serious attempt on my life and I was institutionalized um, by a real institution. But I called my counselor, I called my counselor and asked him for help. And uh, I was shunned, I was just rejected entirely. Too. He couldn't get off the phone with me faster. Um, so since then, I've stayed sober. I am still in recovery. I am 17 years sober now, which kind of disrupts their narrative that you can't stay sober outside of this program. And it's a mixed bag for me, too, that my sobriety started in this place. Um, but I don't give them any credit for that introduction, you know, of, for what I've maintained, because um, I've maintained that through a lot of different avenues with some really helpful <laughs> and kinder yeah. avenues of recovery. But uh, but no, so since then, um, you know, I was able to graduate high school um, a, a year behind. Uh, I got to go to college. I've been able to uh, start a, you know, start up my life. I've been a, a small business owner. I've married. I'm um, a homeowner now and I have a lot of dogs and cats. Um, but since this pandemic, what has happened is uh, a survivor group popped up on Facebook and that was in November. And now there's over 700 members. And out of those members, some of us got together and decided that we'd like to take some action and try to hold these places accountable or to shed light on to unknowing parents and families of like what's happening, you know, because I no longer feel plagued by this place, but I hate that I know young teens and are going through this and they feel alone. So with the enthusiastic sobriety abuse website um, that some really talented people uh, have created, we really wanted to spread awareness to uh, what's happening within these programs, how long they've been going, the repeated problems um, and accusations that have been consistent since the 70s. Ever since this begun, it's kind of like the storyline hasn't changed. Um, in 2005, when I was there, there was a big shakeup, media shakeup from another group of survivors that started a, a, an older website at the time called On the Emmis. And there was an ABC News report. Um, several articles came out. And I remember when that happened and a lot of people left, um, a lot of staff left, a lot of group members left. Feels like we're picking up the torch, you know, um, from what those groups of survivors from 2005 and some of them now are still active and kind of refurbished in our new enthusiastic sobriety abuse organization and we are helping survivors not feel so alone be able to uh, file ethical complaints to licensing boards and other governmental oversight committees. We're also teaming up with Breaking Code Silence, which mm -hmm. is another nonprofit organization that is um, looking to dismantle and hold accountable this troubled teen industry that's really predatory and abusive to um, youth that and minors that don't have the rights to advocate for themselves. Really, we just want to get the message out. And as we are taking um, action on licensing boards and reporting um, of ethical complaints towards these facilities, we really want to just spread the stories and awareness and also provide resources for ex-members and ex-staff to get some understanding of, you know, um, being in a high control group um, having access to appropriate therapist and um, mental health resources and as well as a support group that you're just not alone in those experiences. It's such great work that you're doing, Liz. I want to say how grateful I am for you contacting the show so that you could speak out about this group. I will leave links to the ESA website and its social media in the description below. 
And all that's left to say is thank you once again for coming on to Talk Beliefs. Mark, thank you so much. It was incredible. And to all the other current and former group members of Enthusiastic Sobriety Programs, I just want to say I see you and I believe you. Thanks for having me on.